Very good. Well, hey, I'm ready when you are. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Robert Pollock. I don't know if you saw the promo video that I produced, but um, uh, back in March, I published an ebook titled How to Develop. Can you see my screen right now, by the way? You can. Okay. How to Develop High Performing Teams During a Pandemic Five Steps to Come Out Stronger on the Other Side. So, in my consulting practice, I, I, I'm a, uh, uh, I use a, the Culture Index intellectual property in my consulting practice. I work with uh, a little under 80 CEOs all over the country, helping them scale their top and bottom line revenue and to create sustainable scalability within their organization. That's what I do day in and day out. But I was having all these conversations with CEOs and leaders that prompted me to write that ebook. That ebook is available at my website. It's free, uh, robertpollock.com. You can download it right now. You can download it afterwards. Also, you've got my email information here and LinkedIn. If you wanna talk with me about anything coming out of this, then just hit me up, okay? So the, the thing that prompted this was <clears throat> our need back then to, uh, to get through this and to create a more positive or future-oriented mindset or offensive mindset for what's after this. So back then in March, we were mired down with the present and I needed to get people to think offense like my most aggressive CEO clients were thinking. And so I'm gonna go through this information. My goal here today is to, that's me, you don't care about me. My goal here today is to, to move your thinking from defense to offense, is to cut through the noise, to clarify your thinking. And by that, I just wanna give you one or two ideas that you can grab hold of yourself that are meaningful for you to help you move to a forward-oriented offensive mindset and to, to reset your personal and vision, business vision. Uh, it'd be interesting to know, Casey, how many on here, how many people on here are CEOs? Like you're, you're it, you're the owner. Anybody? Anybody wanna raise their hand if they are? I'm not actually sure. Anybody CEO? Maybe not. We have quite a few common desk stuff on here. So, all right. There may not be any. So, so here's the thing this is a great opportunity to reset your vision, mission, and values for your organization relative to what you want out of this company if you're a CEO. Uh, the, where employees come in and other leaders come in is to contribute towards that effort because every CEO wants more clarity in that and they want to achieve their ultimate goal. So everybody's in this together on that. Uh, also, an objective is to make some important people decisions through this, this time and to get, for again, for CEOs to get more of what they want out of their company. All right, so there are, five steps to coming out of, out of this pandemic stronger than when you went in. Uh, one is to, uh, or step one is to find your North Star. And to get very real, if you're a leader, a CEO or business owner, with what your North Star is, what are you ultimately trying to achieve? What does winning look like to you? Regardless of the success up to now, there are usually some gaps with all of the CEOs I work with between where they are or the successes that they've achieved thus far relative to what they really ultimately want, okay? That all starts with that vision, that CEO, that owner's vision. If you're on a leadership team, again, contribute as a leadership team or as a leader, but it starts there. Uh, there are three initial questions that I identified need to be answered to, uh, to set that in motion. One, am I ready for the fight? We are in for a fight coming out of this. Does everybody agree with this? Tom, do you agree that we are in for a fight? If so, give me a thumbs up. 
If not, uh, there we go. All right. If you disagree, the thumbs down time would be fine, by the way. Uh, but it's going to be a fight. So, so here's the deal. We got to, we got to figure out if we're up for it. Um, you know, there, there are some, there's some people right now. Uh, I am 56 years old. I was born in the last year of the baby boom generation, but there are some people that have been running, that have grown a company, have been running it for 20 or 30 years that might just say, I, I don't have it in me to do the hard work that's going to be required coming forward to, to get where this company needs to go or to build the potential of this organization. And so it's, it's very important to get real with yourself in that regard so that you can set your plans accordingly. Do I need succession plan? Do I want to position this thing to sell, et cetera? Uh, that's the next question is, do I want to be ready for the fight? If I'm not ready right now, I got to ask myself, well, do I want to be ready? I mean, seriously. Also, what do I want my business and life to look like on the other side? If you're a CEO that's, that's running, you know, 60, 80 hours a week running your business and you don't want it to look like that anymore or coming out of this, you would like to re-architect it. This is the time to create a plan for that to happen or to make that happen. Make sense? All right. Hopefully, Brad, that makes sense to you as well. All right. So consider your options. This is this is getting very real, guys. Okay, because we've got to start with with a, a very real expectation of what we want. Uh, option number one is, hey, I want to cash in my chips. I'm tired. I I want to do something else, or uh, you know, I'm tired of this business. I've already scaled it. I've already been there, done that. Or I need somebody else to take the a ball and run with it from here. That's option one. Option two, rebuild this thing bigger and better. Maintain my core company, maintain our core product and service, but build it bigger and better. Or number three, what a lot of people are doing right now is they're doing some, some sort of a pivot and they're building something massively different or a little bit different than what it was before this disruption. Okay. You got to get real about your vision, mission, and values. So I used to think years ago that mission, that vision, mission, and values was a bunch of corporate nonsense, okay? And done incorrectly or done just, just to do it, it is a bunch of nonsense. But as CEOs or, or entrepreneurial organizations, when you do this right, it does create that North Star for all the decisions that come after. So this is a great opportunity to, to reset and reevaluate what really is our vision. What do I really want this thing to look like? What's our mission? And what are our foundational values and principles that we're going to operate under? If you don't have clarity in that, there's room for wise counsel, right? I'm meeting with one of my peers tomorrow for lunch because why? We, because we bounce things off of each other. Uh, he's an experienced guy about my age. We've done a lot of things. We've made a lot of mistakes. And so it's really good to have wise counsel. Uh, I was telling Casey that at the end of this, I, I, I am going to offer to field any, you know, anybody can email me. I'll field a phone call. I'll get on the call with you if you want to run anything by me, if you think I can help in any way um, to be some counsel or a piece of your counsel, then uh, I'm certainly willing to do that. But uh, leverage other people. Uh, don't think you've got to come up with all this on your own. Also, if you're leading a team, leverage your team. If you've got the players that you want to go to battle with coming out of this, leverage them uh, for good ideas. Okay, everybody, does that make sense, Brad? All right, very good. Okay, step number two, create three plans. Now, hopefully... Everybody on this call has already created plan number one. That's your survival plan. We've gotten here. You, you already looked at your accounts payable. Uh, you already looked at your uh, accounts receivable, your cash position. You talked with your, your CFO or your accountant. You've, you've done all those survival uh, planning and, and you've been executing over the past few weeks. The next plan that you need to have in place is your recovery plan. 
what a recovery plan is, and I talk about this more in the book, is um, that's just to get to your new normal, new operating normal. The third is your growth plan. That's the bigger visionary long-term, where do I wanna be five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, and what do I want my life to look like? By the way, every CEO I'm working with is doing some version of this. Here's something key to remember or to, to know, A players within organizations are also doing this for themselves. Heads up, if you got some A players, I, here, here's what I think is going to happen, and I've already seen it some, is employers are gonna be very surprised when A players leave their organization coming out of this for another opportunity. Because everybody who's an A player or top producer, if they're looking at their existing organization or existing leadership and they see weakness relative to what their goals are long term, they're creating a recovery plan and, and a growth plan. And it may or may not include your company unless you're proactive. Okay. So that right team is critical to achieving these three plans. Uh, the bad news is underperforming teams cause a lot of CEOs to diminish their, their dreams and their goals. And uh, so many CEOs I talk with, my first conversation with them is about whether they're hitting their numbers or not, whether this is producing the kind of lifestyle that, that they want. And, you know, I get this kind of, Oh, well, yeah, we're doing well. And uh, you know, it's a couple of questions in they, they confess. Yeah. But I really think we should be here, but, I haven't been able to get there, et cetera. And of course, that's what I help with in my advisory practice. But, but uh, uh, weak teams diminish dreams, all right? Uh, the good news is I'm about to tell I'm out of this downturn uh, with a high-performing team that will help you accomplish your new plans. S step number three is to evaluate your team, and this, you not only have to get real, but you have to get very real. Start with yourself, then your leadership team, then the rest of your employees. Know thyself first. As a CEO or as a leader of a division, you've got to know what you're great at and what you suck at. In Culture Index, I have the sharpest way to measure people's hardwired thinking and to gather data to know what they're good at, how they process information, etc. But if, if you don't have data, just think about what activities tire you out mentally and what activities boost your energy level. That's the quickest down and dirty way to know this is what I want to spend my time doing. So that then you can organize your company and your role in it accordingly. Because ultimately when we're doing stuff that we suck at or it's hard or it's behavior modification, away from our hard wiring, that's what tires us out and, and drains our energy to grow this thing as big as it could possibly grow, okay? The next step is to uh, take a look at your leadership team. Again, you've gotta have the right leadership team to be able to run as fast as you wanna run. In my practice, a lot of times I look at organizations and we evaluate it first before I ever engage with a, a CEO and, and I know that they're, they're, there's a gap between where they are and where they want to be. I look at their team and I can tell who they're, who they're, who's struggling with the work assigned to them and who their A players are and why. And it's that, it's the, those weak direct reports, quote, weak direct reports that are, they're stopping them from achieving their ultimate goal. All right. And so you got to know yourself as a CEO first. You got to know your leaders. Do I have the right leadership team around me? Or has this thing just morphed into this certain animal or machine because of the booming economy that we've been riding and that wave? And really, to come out of this as strong as possible, I need to make some changes. All right. So uh, I had a client here recently that did that. And the, his comment to me was You know, I, I've known it for a long time. We've talked about it, Robert. It's this, this person and that person. I've known they weren't the best in these roles, 
but it just took this for me to make the change. And that's unfortunate. It's not fair for the rest of the company. And it really wasn't fair for that employee. They're a good person. They were just in the wrong seat on the bus to contribute what we needed. Okay. So there's some, some of this aspect or some aspects of this evaluation of your team really suck. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, there's some real upsides for people. Evaluate the rest of your team. You got to evaluate the employees third because you've got to know what kind of leadership is over them to be able to judge their performance. If they've got a weak leader, it's hard to judge their, their performance without looking at their leader. All right. Uh, also in this team, in, in, in my book, I go through this, this scenario where there's, there's a bit of panning for gold opportunity here where you can spend time identifying and really, really looking deeply at your team. And, and there's opportunity to find some real gold in there that you just didn't realize was there before that are your future A players. They're your future leaders. But you're, we were so busy in the boom that we didn't have time to really examine that. And a lot of times those were the, the, the people that were just about to leave before this downturn. And if you're not careful, that person that is your future A player, your future leader coming out of this will be the first one to jump ship for a better opportunity because you did not recognize their capacity. So in my business, I use data analytics or people analytics measuring hardwired thinking relative to what I know is required in a role. And I teach my clients how to do this. But, and culture index is dynamite on that. But if you're not gonna use culture index, use some kind of objective data measure of hardwired thinking relative to the role and look at that down your team to find that gold that represents your future leaders for high potential for you. Also think about this, right fit employees lead, need less leadership. You tracking with me on that? Okay, so if you've had to make leadership changes, if you've had to thin your leadership tier, now you're looking for who down here, based on new roles, new requirements, is going to require less leadership in the new structure. If you don't, I'm just telling you, if you don't have some way to measure somebody's hard wiring, you're not going to know precisely who that is and who, who's not, okay? So get some data. If you want to talk about uh, free evaluation of your team using my data, that email me and we'll set that up. That's what I do for CEOs, a free evaluation of their team. If you have access to some other data, ours happens to be the sharpest or high, has the highest validity of anything out there. But if you've got something that's good, that has a good solid validity, use that. Uh, but if you want my help, let me know. Because right now I'm finding, uh, my, my clients are finding some gold down in their teams uh, that uh, are, are right fits for the new workload allocation coming out of this under the new plans. Anybody have any questions about step number three, evaluating CEO leadership or employees? Tom, Brad, Amanda, Risa, any, any questions about that? No questions. Yeah, All sorry. Right. I, I, I had a quick question. Sorry, I had to yeah. unmute myself and get my notes out of my way. Uh, what, this may be something you'll address later, but when it comes to getting the best out of your team and out of your employees, you know they're capable, you know they, they have that in them, but sometimes they just get stuck in their own way, whether it's a mindset or a bad attitude or bad uh, a history of past experience where they feel taken advantage of. So they, they sort of create their own roadblock that they don't get over. How do you help bridge that gap? Yeah, so, so a few things that I heard there, Brad, and, and having an offline conversation to know exactly what you're talking about would be helpful. But how do you know they're capable? Uh, I think sometimes you see you know, moments of, of clarity either in a project or in, a, in an emergency or you, you see that, that time where they've just sort of stepped up and it's, it's an uncommon um, 
way where either in, in a certain project or at a certain time or in a meeting, you just see something that you go, oh, there's some gold there that you did. You actually did naturally. You don't often let yourself do that. Or you see times where, where that could happen, except they sort of undercut them, sort of take their legs out or, or just choose a, a different mindset or a different attitude that doesn't allow them to, to achieve that. Yeah. So, so a couple of things. One, there's, there's a difference between our hard wiring that, that drives our natural behaviors and behavior modification. I have the capacity to do something that I, I'm not hardwired to do well consistently, but I can do it for a moment as long as you don't make me do it every day. Right. And so, so that spurt could be coming from that place where you've got a square peg in a round hole, but they, they have a capacity periodically to behavior modify enough to get the job done. That's not what you want. But if you've got an A player who's a square peg in a square hole and they're just underutilized until those unique situations where they can uh, maximize their, their great fit, knowledge, attitude, et cetera, now you've got a flight risk. A players aren't going to put up with that very long. Okay? So now I'm frustrating. I'm an A player, and Brad doesn't let me be an A player. That's a problem. Or my manager doesn't let me be an A player. I want to know what's driving their natural behaviors, what their natural right seat is on this bus, so I can leverage that every day to get more done faster, to take the guesswork out of teamwork, those types of things to maximize my scale and to reduce turnover and to, and to top grade those A players. Keep, keep them and then top grade the C players into, into better players. The, the other thing that you mentioned, Brad, was uh, uh, what if they have a, a bad attitude? I have no tolerance for bad attitude. I don't care how smart somebody is, how capable, or how, how the, they are right wired for a role. If they've got a bad attitude, in my experience of 34 years in professional experience, uh, the sooner you can get them out, the better. Now, what caused the bad attitude? If I'm not letting an A player perform up to an, uh, perform at a high level, there are certain hardwired, there are certain people that are hardwired to get very disruptive trying to fix that within your organization. I know because I have a way to measure hard wiring. I know who those people are. And so I call that the, the you know, being the certain, certain kind of wiring disruptive. When they start acting, when people wired like this start acting out, that's a great sign for the leader to say, whoops, wait a minute, we don't have alignment here. And to sit them down and confront them and say, hey, why don't you think you can win here? What changes do you think, you know, impacted your ability to contribute at your highest level and accomplish what you want to accomplish here? Because something has, because you're, you're, you're causing a big ruckus here right now, right? And, and, so, and so you've got to know what's driving that. But somebody with just a, with a bad attitude, uh, they're just a sour person. Uh, next. Make sense, Brad? Yep, thank you. Hey, Brad, you don't have a bad attitude, do you? No, right now. Okay, all right. All right, <laughs> good. Good. Hey, it's amazing when you recognize somebody's potential and where their right seat on your bus and you start leveraging the heck out of that. Oh, my gosh. But you're doing it scientifically, not you know, every once in a while we squirrel out and do that without data, without objective measures. But when you do it scientifically and specifically and you know how to feed that, oh my gosh, now, now you get scale. And, and you, get, uh, you get your future leaders. Great question. Oh, uh, step number four, employee development and engagement. That's what hopefully organizations have been doing right now. Common Desk is doing it. Uh, right now, Nick has been uh, uh, putting out the state of the uh, of the union kind of messages on a regular basis. Uh, over communicate, over communicate, over communicate in this culture, in this uh, in environment that we're in right now. Continue to cast vision as a leader and train like crazy. Take advantage of this to train either. Uh, uh, I'm going to say generically or at the macro level around skills or at the micro level relative to their particular job, but train, 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 train. This is a great opportunity to do that. Now, 
here's, here's the reality. This week is a tipping point for all of this. Okay, for our US economy and for, for your organizations, this week, that, that things are gonna tilt, okay? And so now we're, we're coming out of this and you gotta apply those same strategies, but just in a different way. The fifth step of this five-step program or process to come out of this stronger than when you went in is to uh, continue recruiting, you, got, you can't stop, you gotta be clever and you gotta be candid. Continue, meaning uh, a lot of the big boys that were, hog, that were crowding the, the job boards cut their, their uh, recruiting budget off, went, went to zero. Um, and that gave big opportunity for, for small and mid-market businesses to gain visibility in that space. Also, my clients that, that jumped on that quickly are finding more right fit people Again, I have the way to measure right, right fit. They know what the experience and knowledge they need. You combine those together and you get right fit people. Uh, they're finding them uh, when under the full employment that we were in a, a few uh, weeks ago, those people weren't applying for positions. They, they weren't looking. Uh, also, that's one of the indicators that I know A players have their head up and they're looking around uh, is because my clients have been able to steal fully employed people in this market because they're looking for a better opportunity because they see holes in the ship that they're on right now and uh, that it's not worthy of their talent, to be frank, right? And so you got to continue to recruit. You got to be clever. Uh, in Culture Index, we've, we, we have a, a way to measure hardwired thinking and to write ads that speak directly that person's language. So we call them out to where they come in and they get hired and say, oh my gosh, uh, hey, can I ask, ask you about that, that ad? I've never seen an ad describe me so well. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so you've gotta be very specific in what you're looking for, whether you have data to do that with, or if you just need to get uh, role specificity, but be very specific, stand out in this market, because there's a lot of talent out on the street right now, or currently employed that's, that is looking and will have a conversation with you. That leads me to the third bullet point, which is to be candid. If you can't hire somebody right now, pull the trigger, but you're looking at the market and you're building relationships with future potential employees, just be honest with them. Just, just hit them up quickly uh, and let them know, here's where we stand, we're three weeks out or whatever it is, but man, we want to talk to you. If you're willing, we'd love to have a conversation with you. Uh, a players are having those conversations right now, even if they aren't ready to make a change or if that employer's not ready to pull the trigger right now, because again, they're looking to upgrade their situation. Make sense? So Tom, hey Tom, can you unmute for a minute? Yes. So Tom, what business are you in? I do professional coaching, uh, uh, leadership, executive coaching, and okay. I'm particularly interested in working with teams and the science of, of teams. Got it. Well, a lot of this is resonating with you, right? Right, right. Yeah. I How just wanted to quickly mention, quickly oh, mention a, a, a book from several years ago when I was working at Microsoft, I discovered this called The Manager's Guide to Coaching. And the idea was, if you have an employee that's not getting there, first, is it a is it a knowledge or content? Is it a training barrier that's there? Do they need to know something they don't know? Or is there some internal process or hurdle they can't get around that you can help them get around that? Or is it the things we've been talking about, the mental attitude, maybe uh, limited uh, beliefs, maybe uh, uh, an immunity to change? And, and that's where you have to coach them and and put the onus on them to make the change inside of them that will let them move forward. Got it. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Hey, Brad, how about you? What business are you in? So my, my background's marketing. Yeah, my background's marketing, but then I also do a lot of writing and, and some coaching on the side for mindset and success principles and setting Got and it. achieving goals. Cool. So a lot of this is resonating with you oh, as man. well. Yeah, right? it's gold. Gold. Yeah. Yeah. So 
recruiting guys right now is the time um, this week. And I, th I think after, I think the big boys are going to turn their, their, uh, their advertising budgets back on, their recruiting budgets back on. Um, we'll see uh, how that goes, but, uh, but we're watching it. Here's the thing, guys, conclusion. Uh, what we need to do as CEOs is to get back on offense, to stop looking down and start looking out because we are coming out of this. We will come out of this. It's hard to think about that sometimes because of all this, this, this cramped up kind of uh, stuff going on, but your mindset for the future is essential. Uh, establish that North Guard. Uh, North Star to guide your decisions. It's very easy when you know where you're going to base every decision, people decision, process decision, organizational decision, financial decision, with the simple question of, well, would making this decision move me closer to or farther away from my goal or my North Star? Write down your plans, you know, that uh, uh, those three plans that I talked about, make sure that they're in writing. Uh, failing to plan equals planning to fail. We don't want to do that. Uh, make the hard people decisions using some kind of objective people criteria, some kind of highly valid way to measure hardwired thinking, how it matches the role, and uh, rally and feed that team. Rally, rally, rally. We all need that right now. Our employees need that more than ever. So um, you got you to be proactive about that. And again, proactive about top grading your teams because a lot of the job descriptions are changed coming out of this. Uh, maybe people are having to wear more hats, et cetera. So the risk is you take somebody who is very good at their previous job, now you change the job and you set them up for failure. So with that guys, uh, if you want the, the free ebook, go to robertpollock.com. If you want to touch base with me about anything, robert at robertpollock.com, that works, or rpollock at cultureindex.com, or hit me up on LinkedIn. What questions do you have? Y'all can put questions in the chat if you want to, or feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. And Amanda's been very quiet. Yeah, I have another question for you, Robert. Yes, sir. You, you were talking about the fact that A players will use this time to create their goals for growth and then evaluate their current environment, and decide if that's the place where they can achieve those goals. And if not, they're going to be looking elsewhere. And you touched very briefly on what you can do as a team or as an employer to identify yourself as an environment where these people want to come. Can you elaborate on that and how you can set yourself up as the place that A players will identify you as, as where they can grow and achieve goals rather than just some clever marketing and, and copy to get people in and not much more than that. Yeah. So it's, it's again, it's paramount. I've been, I've been using very precise people analytics for measuring of hardwired data uh, uh, for over seven years now with Culture Index. And here's what I've learned is when you have data that tells you exactly how somebody's wired, where you're not guessing, now you know how to motivate somebody, okay? So I have clients that are looking for risk averse people in a high risk tumultuous market. So their, their, their ads are all directed towards that very low risk, very, hey, you know, it's just, this is the safest move is for you to talk with this kind of a kind of a structure. Also for their A players that they have to your point, my clients know who is risk averse. They know who is change averse. They know who is that wild Mustang and is about to jump the fence, right? And they know how to talk with them, each one. So you've got to know your players, I call it taking the guesswork out of teamwork or, or just knowing the person you're talking with using data, not just your interaction with them so that you can, you can know how to communicate, know what they need from you. 
because it's different for different people based on their hard wiring. Does that make sense, Brad? Yes, yes it does. But and I guess to, to add a follow-up question to that, if you're already in relationship with someone, that seems a lot easier. What about people who you're not in relationship with? How would you, or the, to, to turn this around, if, if you were an A player and you were stuck and you were looking to identify an environment of perhaps beyond your, your current network, what are some of the hallmarks that you would look for? Well, it, again, it's based on what your your it's based on that person's hard wiring, what they're looking for. If you've got a lot of these these more risk averse people that I've, I just talked about that are great at execution and just consistent execution, just writing code or whatever they they do very very well. And right now they're nervous because where they are is showing big vulnerabilities, and so for them they're looking for security. They're looking for stability. And so they're going to, they're going to have to dig into their, to their financials and, and, and how long a company has been in, in place, the CEO's resume. They're, they're, those are those types of people you track, you, you know, some of those, right? Then there's some other ones that are, that are just racehorses. They're just wild Mustangs and they're just looking for, for greener pastures, more wide open pastures, where I am is restricting me. I'm capable of this. They're only letting me do that. I'm not happy. And they're looking for expanse. They're looking for upside growth, even if it means them taking a financial risk to do so because they're that confident in their own abilities. They just need some pasture that allows them to run. And that's a totally different conversation. That's what I'm saying. If you don't have data to know who's who, we all have an, an ability to modify our behavior and fool people, right? Job interviews are, are designed behavior modification. People come into those modifying their behavior, right? Because that's a sales call. And so they put on whatever they think the audience wants from them. If you have data, you can cut that nonsense out, edit my language. You can cut that out and, and you can talk to that person uh, based on the reality of what, what they're looking for in their hard wiring. My clients do that all the time. Hey, I don't think this is who you are. Can we stop the interview and just have a conversation? We have three problems. I want to pitch those problems to you, get your initial thoughts. Can we do that? Because they know a problem solver, an analytical deductive reason problem solver is sitting in front of them. But they have measured their what's between their ears to know that. And now all of a sudden, they've got a leg up in the recruiting game because, oh, they get me. Yeah, well, that would be great. I'd love that. I hate interviews. Yeah, me too. Here's our problems. You know, and now you go like this. Now you're the top candidate for them to go to work for. So it, de it depends on the person. Yeah. Sounds like it creates a lot more authenticity on both sides. Totally. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. Yeah. If you're... If you're not using people analytics in, in the hiring process, um, you, you're losing to your competitors. Not everybody is right now. So, so as we spend all of our time studying, interpreting, and mobilizing seven work-related traits that are highly valid that we measure to drive business results, what we've seen is uh, it, it, it outstrips their competitors in their industry. And and people who aren't doing this, I, I, you know, we think, we think our, our grandkids, they're going to think people who didn't use people analytics to help them make people decisions were just, in, just total losers because it's going to be that become that prevalent uh, coming up. I mean, it's somewhat prevalent now, but nowhere near what it will be 10 to 20 years from now. So do it now. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Anybody else have any more questions? Y'all can throw them up in the chat or ask. Just unmute yourself so we can hear you. I know for myself, I even said in the chat, I was like, I mean, I'm not a CEO or really a big leader in my company, but this has been like so eye-opening for me. 
um, even being like kind of on the bottom of the totem pole. So thank you so much, Robert. Well, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, and, and you, you latched on to it. It doesn't matter where you are in the organization. You've got to understand these are foundational principles are universal. And so how do I contribute fav favorably to that as a, a team member? Huge. Hi, Mary Catherine. Hi, Robert. Good to see you. Thank you for this. It's good hearing it even a second time. You are very welcome. Guys, it's been a pleasure. Any more questions for me? I think that's right. it, Robert, but thank you so much. You're very welcome. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions, just shoot me an email. Okay. Y'all have a good Thanks, one. Thanks, Robert. Bye, y'all. Have a great day.